Uh, the next presenter is Joseph Sweet from the Salk Institute. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Today, uh, I'm going to pick up kind of where Sandra left off um, and speak about multi-ohm assays, um, sharing with you both wet lab and bioinformatic insights and tips uh, that I hope will be helpful if, uh, if you decide to pursue this kind of assay. Um, before I get into the technique, I'll just give you a short background on the biological question uh, that I'm pursuing, because I think that will help explain some of the experimental path uh, that I chose. So I'm interested in photosynthesis and in particular um, how C4 crops like sorghum differ in the way they photosynthesize compared to C3 crops like rice. And this is a really uh, nice question for single cell approaches because the difference lies in which cells do the photosynthesis. So in sorghum, it's the bundle sheath, and you can say, see that because it's full of chloroplasts. Whereas in the ancestral photosynthesis type, it, photosynthesis plays out in the mesophyll. So we thought if we approached uh, these two species with multiomic uh, assays, we could tease out how these different cell types um, regulate photosynthesis. Okay, so to do that, what we wanted to um, perform was a time series experiment where we grew seedlings in the dark in etiolated state and then watched how gene expression and chromatin accessibility changed in the first 12 hours of light treatment. And so what I'm showing you here is our experimental design, and this is work that I'm conducting in collaboration with Leonie Lugenbuehl at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and what we did is we performed 10x RNA and cyrna 6 3 assays, as well as the multi-ohm assay at the etiolated time point and at the 12-hour time point, as well as an attack-seek approach called scale bio. And so for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to just walk through how we performed both the multi-ohm and the, the single nuclei attack experiments. Okay, so what I'll begin with is talking about uh, the 10x multi-ohm workflow. Sandra talked a little bit about it, so I'll pick up where she left off. Um, but essentially, the, the premise of this workflow is as follows. One would extract nuclei, and then uh, the goal is to sequence both the accessible chromatin within genomic DNA, as well as the trace amounts of mRNA that's present within the nucleus. So the 10X multi kit can achieve that by first tagmenting the genomic DNA that's present within your isolated nuclei fraction. And an enzyme called TN5 introduces those adapters into accessible regions that will later be PCR amplified. Once you've tagmented your nuclei, you then load it onto the 10X chip. And as you know, that's a micro kind of fluidics chip where nuclei are being pressed through this capillary, being married with a bead that contains a unique oligo set. And then within the emulsion, each bead and nucleus um, results in attack and RNA uh, seq library prep. Uh, and what I want to just point out, and this will be relevant later, is that not all. Uh, not all droplets are used. So there will be some, uh, some gems that are not filled by nuclei. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, so how do we apply this technique to plants? So the first thing is that uh, this is not a protoplasting uh, technique. The, the kit does not work with protoplasts. It uh, is only amendable to nuclei. So protoplasts are off the table. Also, when we were deciding how to, uh, to choosing our sample type, we wanted to avoid uh, using nuclei from frozen tissue. So as we heard previously, frozen tissue will reduce the mRNA yield, but also, and this is not really, this is more of a gut feeling rather than a scientific insight, but just from my PhD lab and from my postdoc and speaking with other people, 
Frozen tissue can often have disrupt uh, chromatin states. So assays like ATAG-seq and CHIP-seq don't seem to work as well compared to fresh tissue. Similarly, we wanted to avoid using uh, sorting nuclei by, fa by fax. Um, and we've done both fax and without fax, both are, both are good. Um, but if, you're, if you're a lab that doesn't do a, a lot of fax, um, then um, it can be tricky to implement. So today I'm just gonna show you a workflow where we just take fresh nuclei um, and load it straight into the 10X multi-ohm workflow. So how do we achieve that? Here's a picture of how we uh, process our tissue. So uh, here's my sorghum etiolated nuclei and I harvest my, my tissue and then chop uh, into in the buffer on ice and chopping is much better than say pulverizing your tissue through uh through bead bashing or through mortar and pestle it's much softer um, and it creates less debris so after about five or ten minutes of chopping you're you're kind of releasing your nuclei into solution um and and not creating any kind of additional debris that could clog the the chip later on so once you've you've got your, uh, your solution. The next thing is that you wanna enrich for your nuclei. Uh, and what we use in the lab is a gradient um, and it's an OptiPrep based gradient, uh, which works pretty similarly to how you would think a sucrose gradient works, where you have a 45% OptiPrep density layer at the bottom and then lay it on top as a 15% density buffer. And then on top of that, you have filtered tissue. And you can see the filtered tissue here, it's kind of a little bit more um, cloudy. Okay, and so just, I'm holding up to the light in this way because it's not clear, but the, the gradient boundaries are here. After centrifugation, you then enrich your nuclei at this 45%, 15% density, uh, layer and you can see and it's kind of hard to see but you see these kind of little blobs here that's your enriched nuclei it's not a lot but it's going to be enough for your chip whereas you can see up here there's more uh there's more debris that's that's the junk that you want to remove okay so then the hard part for the 10x multi ohm kit is in fact that you don't have much working volume in which to load the chip so after you've extracted your enriched nuclei, you then need to concentrate it into this very small volume, 30 microliters. A lot of that's gonna be nuclei, but a lot of that's also gonna be debris. And it's also gonna be quite clumpy. So if you go straight from your enriched nuclei into the 10X chip, it's gonna clog. And clogging is you know, probably the kind of choke point in this assay where uh, you're, you've got your nuclei, but, but the, a clog erupts because you're trying to push too much material through that microfluidics. So what can you do? What we do in the lab is that we filter, we take a conventional filter and we throw the 30 microliters onto that filter. There's, there's not enough volume there to, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the material to flow through. But if you flip it upside down and pipette from the other side, you get a really nice, clean, resuspended nuclei um, sample that you can then go straight onto the chip with. And so we've done this quite frequently and we rarely get clogs when we use direct filtered nuclei in this way. Before you load on the, on the chip, as a lot of other um, uh, speakers have said, you, you, would, you wanna visualize your, you wanna visualize your propidium, you want to, sorry. You want to visualize your nuclei um, using propidium iodide staining um, because you want to visualize what are, what are the correct nuclei versus debris. Okay, so after you've run um, each of your samples through that workflow, you're then ready to load them onto the chip it's quite expensive. It's 2000 bucks per reaction. Um, and, and that's why you want to avoid clogging.
um, because then that's money down the drain. Uh, okay. So then on the other side, um, you then make attack libraries and RNA libraries from your, uh, from, your, from your samples. What I'm showing you here is a good uh, kind of version of an attack library where you see uh, the nice uh, uh, histone phasing, but also if you don't see that histone phasing, it's not a problem. So this, this library looked just fine um, in the UMAP space. Similarly, when you look at RNA libraries, you see a, you'll see a DNA, uh, DNA smear, but sometimes you see these artifacts on the gel, on the, on the, on the tape station, um, but these also don't seem to be too problematic. Uh, and then you wanna to aim to sequence around five to million, 10, five, 50 to 100 million reads to begin. Okay, and one kind of critical point that I'd like to point out is that once you've aligned your 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 samples uh, using the Surat software. Surat will provide uh, sorry uh, 10x software. The 10x software will give you a QC report that will tell you how well your your transcripts in the RNA space are mapping to your genomes and transcriptomes. And so here's an example for rice where you see, you know, 82 uh, or 77 percent of uh, the reads are mapping to exonic or transcriptome uh, phases, respectively. But I've often seen uh, that these can be artificially low, and that may happen not because uh, your experiment has failed, but in fact, because your GTF file is not appropriate. Um, and so, for example, a colleague uh, was, doing, was doing Lotus, and she found that these numbers were very low and she thought, oh, my experiment failed. But in fact, it was because, um, because the GTF file wasn't annotated properly. So look out, out for those markers because that may indicate um, something is going wrong in the bioinformatic space. Okay, so the output of this experiment was in the for rice, I sequenced uh, 10,000 nuclei. Here are the different CARP clusters that represent different cell types. And here we have both etylated and light treated nuclei overlapping pretty well. And then we can see expression of our favorite genes, such as Rubisco. And we can also look for then how those genes not only perform in terms of gene expression, but also accessible chromatin. Uh, uh, in, in, in the attack space. And you can see here, Rubisco is more highly accessible under light treated conditions compared to etylated conditions. Okay. Um, so but the thing that I'll end on is then talking uh, to you about the scale bio kit. Uh, this is an attack, single nuclei attack kit um, that comes from a company that I beta tested uh, with and what it is, the way it works is that Scale Bio provides you with tag, uh, with different TN5 uh, different TN5 enzymes that contain different oligos, uh, sorry, adapters that you then tagment based on your treatments. The reason or the kind of rationale for this is that you can then pull all your nuclei together rather than treating them separately. Uh, and then it, that layer of barcoding allows you then to load this several samples onto the same chip. And then not only that, but you can then superload your, uh, your emulsion and then multiple nuclei can sit in the same, uh, in the same droplet because you have that pre-level uh, pre of um, of fragmentation. And then what's nice is that you can then load 100,000 nuclei per well, rather than say the maximum ceiling of 15,000 that 10X uh, allows you. And so you're, you're essentially loading 10 times more nuclei uh, for only double the price. Okay, and then what results is that Using the rice multi ohm kit, you get, say, 10,000 uh, nuclei sequenced. But 
uh, using rice scale bio, you get uh, over 600,000 sequenced. So just to give you an impression that there are kits out there that can give you an order of magnitude uh, number of nuclei above, above what's available through 10x. So with that, I'll say thank you for your uh, attention and thanks to my collaborator, Leone, uh, who helped out on this, um, on this project, as well as my boss, Joeka, and the Salk Institute and my funding. And thank you, I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Joe. It was a great presentation. And as Sandra said, it's really nice to see people reach the same issues and conclusions. Uh, in a certain way, it's a kind of convergent evolution. And I can also confirm the issues with the GTF files because we, we also have to start from genome sequencing for a lot of species.